So j- just to start for people that are unfamiliar with uh, who you are, could you just start by giving us like a brief overview of where you started at to, well, where you're at now? Sure, I'll go first. Um, so I'm Heather, so I'm a first year gem. Um, I actually applied for medicine back when I was in high school and I didn't get in. So I undertook a bachelor's in pharmacology and then I just completed a master's in cardiovascular science before thankfully successfully getting into graduate entry medicine. Perfect. Chrissy will go second. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) um, I always wanted to do medicine, but I never thought I was good enough for it. So I did uh, an undergrad in biology instead. and then I didn't actually realise that graduate entry medicine was an option until I was taking my cousin on an open day around Nottingham. And I saw it and I was like, oh, wow. So I went and talked to uh, the lady at the counter um, and she told me all about it. So I got a job in a care home. I worked there for two years, applied for graduate medicine and then thankfully got in first time around. So that was, yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, so I'm Hirsch. Um, I studied computer science first and worked as a software engineer for a year. And during my undergrad, and then while I was working, I kind of knew it wasn't what I wanted to do long term. Um, and I was interested in medicine. So then I ended up applying, and here we are. <laughs> yeah, perfect. I mean, it's, it's really fascinating that you guys are all from a diverse background, and yet you've all ended up at the same university studying the same degree. So it's really commendable. I, I guess my my first question would be why medicine? Obviously, it's very cliche, but what what drove you towards studying medicine? As someone who like studied like two degrees that were research based, I always knew I wanted to, like it's very cliche, but I always knew I wanted to help people. And then why medicine specifically? Like. I wanted that patient contact, like, as someone who was going to end up spending the rest of their life, like, at a bench, like, you know, trying to, like, discover science. That's really cool, and I'd love to still do that. But I do love, like, interacting with patients, see, like, having a direct impact on their care and things like that. So that's what pushed me to continue applying for medicine. Of course, yeah. Do you want me to go next, Hesh? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Well, um... I always loved working with people and helping people and um, so I knew I wanted something like that. Um, Working in a care home really emphasised that for me, like just interacting with patients on a daily basis even though like they're not exactly patients, they're residents that we work with but like just helping them with day-to-day tasks really emphasised the importance of um, long-term care and all that and I do love science but I hate research, like just doing my dissertation in undergrad, I hated doing every second of it, so I knew that was not for me, even though I love learning all about the different functions and actions of a single molecule, I just could not sit in a lab for the rest of my life, so that's kind of, medicine was a good, good conjoining of those two things. Um, Yeah, I think my answer is going to be kind of similar, but I knew that I, well, I became more interested in doing something where I could have one-on-one interaction with people um, and doing something that gave a more direct impact. Like, there are a lot of opportunities to work on something, for example, in science or, like, as an engineer in computer science. Uh, You can ultimately help a lot of people or impact a lot of people, but the impact is very indirect. It may take years to be realized. Um, And you won't necessarily get to directly observe the benefit. So doing something in medicine, and specifically being a doctor, gives you the ability to um, see the exact impact of what you've done day after day. And I think that was really appealing to me. And then on top of that, the subject matter I found specifically appealing. So just science and medicine in general, which I think is pretty important if you're going to become a doctor. Yeah, so it does sound like you guys all had like research-based um, careers and you but you guys all wanted to help people so it feels like I, that's the main reason why it drove you all to uh, to medicine in the first place perfect so I guess starting from the be start from the beginning of your application what specific volunteering or work experience did you undertake uh, to aid in your application okay um 
So I actually never had any clinical like volunteer work or anything. I wasn't lucky enough to get it. I literally spent months ringing up every single surgery and hospital nearby and I got rejected from all of them. And that was very disheartening because obviously you see online like people getting these placements like I just didn't know anybody at the end of the day that could help me because I am like the first person in my family or anyone that I know to become a doctor. So what I did was I volunteered at my local care home. So I just was like an activities volunteer. I helped with activities, but then I also like helped in their day to day, like if they needed help eating or like getting dressed or anything like that. So I kind of took on that extra responsibility just so I could see like what it was like to properly care for, as Chris said, not patients, but people that, you know, needed that extra support. Yeah, um, also, I, I volunteered in a student at, at the children's ward at a hospital just as a volunteer, like. We, it was part of my uni. It was called like the fun team. So it was just about like sitting with kids, like when they're in the, um, <laughs> um, when they're just getting discharged and things like that, just to keep them entertained. Perfect. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, I also tried to get placements in like GPs and hospitals, and I failed miserably as well. Um, so I, I, I had applied for a job, so I, was, I had a job in a residential care home for two and a bit years, um, which was mainly just helping with day-to-day -day activities, uh, cooking for residents and things like that. Um, I also worked in a dementia specialty care home for a bit, which was a lot more intense, um, and I'm really glad I did that because it really showed the not so nice side of caring for people and looking after people and horrible things that horrible medical conditions can do to people um so i think that really showed me the spectrum of things um i also applied for st john's ambulance and i managed to do four rounds of that before the coronavirus pandemic hit and we had to stop so yeah so but i didn't actually get to treat anyone myself but I get to see different people being treated by the by my colleagues in St John so first yeah 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 thank you um so I did a little bit of shadowing so when I was finishing high school I shadowed a cardiologist for two weeks and that was kind of the impetus of my interest in medicine um before that it was something that I hadn't strongly considered as a career for myself and after that experience, it kind of made me begin to think, oh, this could be something that's quite interesting. Um, but I was already fairly committed to computer science. So then throughout the course of my degree, I decided I would continue trying to learn a little bit more about medicine. Um, so I spent one summer shadowing in general surgery, which was a really good experience. And then also radiation oncology. And then um, a little bit of time in general practice as well. Uh, so between those experiences, it kind of made me fairly confident that I was interested in medicine. Um, seeing sort of a breadth of specialties was really helpful. And then I also became um, an EMT in the U.S., so working on an ambulance for a while made me very certain that I wanted to be treating patients. And also it made me certain that I wanted to go into medicine as a physician specifically um, because I felt in many, like one of the common questions is why do you not want to become a nurse or a paramedic yeah. or something? And seeing the limitations that are placed on your scope of practice really motivated me to know that, like, okay, I don't want to be working in a very limited field or have a narrowed scope of practice. I want to be able to be the person that has the ultimate decisions on how treatments are implemented and stuff. Yeah, of course. So it does sound like you guys have had prior experience and you've not just gone out on a whim to decide that you want to study medicine. Uh, it's kind of a, a massive relation with, uh, is it Chrissy? Um, when you studied on the dementia ward, I've actually just got a place to um, work as a dementia um, volunteer in my local hospital. So, mm -hmm. obviously, some of that's already gone through. Is there any reflections that you could <laughs> give me on that? Um, well, just when you're with the residents, always be kind. Because I know some of my colleagues, they could get frustrated and... They wouldn't really take it out on the residents, but they wouldn't be as kind sometimes. So, oh, get up, come on, let's go, rather than, like, just 
you know, that extra little mile I think always definitely helps, especially because they don't know what they're doing, they don't know what they're going through, and they just get more frustrated, and you get more frustrated, so just always do the extra mile if you can. Perfect, thank you for that. Right. Yeah, so I, I guess within your application, you guys must have all sat the, the GAMSAT. How did you guys find the GAMSAT, like, just in general first? Personally, I found it the best uh, medical entrance exam I've done. So I've done all three for the UK. I did BMAT and UCAT when I was uh, playing as an undergrad. And then I did UCAT and GAMSAT when I played as a postgrad. And I found it to be the best one. It is extremely tedious. So you literally sit in that room all day. and But it's all about just perseverance in a way. And just like, I can get through this. Like the first, like, as long, yeah. And try not to be nervous. Because I, I, I was lucky. As I was doing it, I was quite calm. Like I had prepped myself a lot beforehand. But I know a lot of people get nervous before. And that's what messes them up, not the content. I feel like if you go in, you've done practice questions and things like that, you can actually smash it, like, first time around. So, yeah, that was my experience. Perfect, yeah. Um, I took it twice, and I only took GAMSAT. And... It was just, like Heather said, it was very draining. It's a very long experience just sitting in one room for a whole day just in silence going through questions after questions after questions. It's just so... But like Heather said, it's just getting through it and knowing that there is light at the end of the tunnel. And Yeah, I found that um, halfway through the last section, I just, I couldn't read anymore. Like... I was reading the words, but they weren't going into my brain. So I just had to try and, like, pick the first answer that I could and hope that that was the right answer and then just keep going. Yeah. Take plenty of drinks and uh, get a coffee in the break if you can. <laughs> yeah, I think that's good advice. Um, I did the UCAT sometime early in my undergrad just to kind of see what it was like. And after taking that, I decided that was probably not what I wanted to do because it's a very different style of exam. Um, and I think the thing is a lot of people look at and compare the two initially and it seems like the GAMSAT would be a lot more difficult and less approachable. And in a way it is, but I think the major advantage is that the path to studying for the GAMSAT is pretty clear and well laid out. Like there's, there are specific subjects that you need to learn. And if you learn those things and can answer questions on them, then you'll be able to do the test. Um, whereas the UCAT, with it being more of an aptitude-based test, I found that I didn't really understand what the strategy was to study. I didn't understand what they were examining exactly and what the goal of the test was. And that, for me, made it kind of intractable. Um, and that's why I decided to take the GAMSAT instead. Um, and I think the advice that was given is good. Like if you, And I think, in a way, it is actually a helpful exam. It's like if you can go through the GAMSAT, you can study these things, learn them, and then take whatever, a six-hour exam on it, then I think that should make you feel a lot more confident that you're prepared to go into medicine in general. Like it's much more indicative of the type of work that we have to do now than like a relatively short aptitude test. Yeah, I guess the, the UCAT's designed to do sort of the bottleneck of graduate entries just to splice splice the, the top few to give them the interviews. Obviously, you can't really revise for it, hence it being a, an aptitude test. So... I guess within your revenge for the GAMSAT, did you guys use any particular resources that you found helpful? Um, I did use, a for section one, I definitely used a past paper booklet. It's back home. But yeah, I used that to kind of get familiar with the questions and things like that. Um, and then for section three, I kind of just used my old resources. Like, I actually, funny enough, I used my BMAT resources for the GAMSAT section um when it came to like the physics and stuff like that um because there is a lot of overlap between gamsat and bmat it's just gamsat is like just it is for postgrad it is that level higher and things like that so yeah that's what i used to study um i actually bought a guide uh, a gamsat revision guide book um i can't remember what it's called now i think it was peter griffiths something like that the griffiths but it, it was quite, it was useful in some ways, but not in other ways. So, like, it was useful, I found it most useful for the middle section. 
um, the essays, giving you a good guide of how to plan them out. Uh, but for the other sections, it just wasn't that useful for me. So I'd already done A-level biology and chemistry, and I just went over all my materials for those. Yeah. So um, I just relearned all A-level biology and chemistry. And then for physics, I tried to learn as much as I could, but I just... I didn't focus as much on that one. I went over everything, but it was all right. And then for the first section, I tried to do some reading around the subject. Um, I read a few recommended books for the recommended book reading. But what I found best for me uh, was just reading the question and going with my first gut response for that. And I got way after doing, because in the, fir the first time I did the test, I tried to analyze it a lot more, like, well, what's this question? What's the answer, blah, blah, blah. But then the second time, I just went with my gut response and I found that was, I got a lot higher mark that time. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I actually think I used the same book that Christy mentioned, which is the Griffiths book. Um, and I agree it was very helpful for the essay section. For me, it was actually really helpful for section three as well. I think coming from a non-scientific background, like I had quite a lot of background in math and physics, but then in chemistry and biology, much less. And having a guide that said, these are the things that you need to know and understand. Um, and these are the concepts that will be examined was actually very helpful. Um, and I think it works if you're the kind of person that wants to be told, like, here's conceptually what you need to know, but we're not going to explain to you how to learn it. Um, then it works really well. And that's what I needed. I needed someone to say, like, these are the things you need to learn. Go learn them yourself and then see if you can do it on the exam. Um, and then in terms of section one, I think that what Chrissy said, I agree with, um, which is that there isn't that much that you need to worry about uh, recalling information. Like, it's really not about whether you read a lot of specific texts or anything. It's really about whether you can read something and process what you're being given and then um, interpret it and answer questions based off of that. And I think probably the best way to study is just by reading in general. Like if you, if you read a lot and if you read dense things, then it's probably natural. Um, but I don't think it's something, especially in science. And for me during my undergrad, it's not something that was really um, examined or tested at all. And so that was something I had to practice, which is like reading uh, paragraph form content, something that's not purely scientific and synthesizing that because there is a lot more discriminating what's useful, what's important and what's not than, for example, in a scientific paper when it's purely just like, it's almost bullet points. It's like everything's yeah. going to be information and it's much easier to distinguish what you do and do not need to pay attention to. Yeah, I totally agree. So I guess obviously you guys all got interviews. Um, most presumably they were MMI style interviews. Yeah. So uh, how did you guys find the MMI styles and how did you guys like approach it? So I've been, I was lucky enough. I've had both panel interviews and MMI and I do prefer MMI. Um, just because I like the fact that each section death tests like a different skill. And if that sex, that station doesn't go right well, get two minutes, just redeem yourself and then go into the next one. Like it's almost like a refresher. So I'm sure people know about like how we get asked about our work experience. We get we get to do role playing and things like that. Also ethical things. Um, it's just nice for it to be broken up and things like that. As I said, like when you're on a panel, say you oh, you mess up, you feel you could have answered a question correctly. You're just sitting there and you have these three people just staring at you constantly for <laughs> for no whoever knows how long. Whereas after like that 10 minute, like five minute, 10 minute, like for that station, you move on, like you just have a, like a restart almost. So I really loved the MMI interview format. Yeah. Um, so I, half of mine were online because of COVID. Um, so my first two were in London and in Liverpool and they were proper MMI um, stations whereas my Swansea and Nottingham one they were both on uh, online interviews so they tried to do the MMI but they weren't quite as they were more like panel interviews just with so they did like 10 questions with two people 10 questions with two other people so yeah but um, I like Heather said I I really I did like the 
in the real ones you could just take a minute reset yourself go back in someone fresh that doesn't know you just start again <clears throat> I, but I do like that in the later ones I was able <clears throat> to build a bit of rapport with them I think yeah. that is why I got the Nottingham one <laughs> so I didn't get the other ones and the Nottingham one when I was just talking to the same two people it was nice because I could just talk with them I could just have a conversation um, and that was really nice but I guess it depends on what kind of person you are what would suit you best yeah um, yeah, I agree. It definitely depends on the person. And I think for me, I definitely had a slightly different experience than Heather, I think. Um, I struggled a little bit more with the MMIs because I'm very used to, I was coming from engineering interviews before, and that was very much based on um, this combination of like technical and behavioral interviews. And so the idea being the two components are like, can you adequately answer technical questions under pressure? And can you also demonstrate that you are a person that people would want to work with? Um, but the method of assessing it is very different. Like the technical bit is maybe similar because it's basically you can either answer the questions or you can't. But in terms of the behavioral bit, it tends to be a lot like, can you build rapport? Uh, when you walk into a room, can you get along with people immediately? And you can just, how do you interact with a room of people or people one-on-one? -on -one? Um, and I think I always had a tendency to kind of lean heavily on that as my skill set, and then kind of for better or worse scrape by on the technical bits um and then so then moving over to an mmi they kind of remove that completely um and so you completely lose the ability to lean on like building rapport with your interviewers um and so i definitely struggled with that um so i think the mmis do come down a little bit more to can you understand what the questions are looking for and essentially give them the answers that they're grading you on because the structure is quite rigid um, yeah, but I'm also not an expert. <laughs> that seemed to work, but I don't really know. Can I be yeah, controversial and counter that? Yeah. So I actually felt that I could build rapport with my interviewers. So I was lucky enough I did it in person for Nottingham, and I felt like you only have like first impressions count a lot. Like when you meet a patient, you won't have like you won't be seeing them every day and things like that. You meet them, you meet them for like ten minutes or so. And you have to build that kind of relationship enough for you to actually like get the information you want. Obviously, in this case, it was the interviewer gets the information they want from you. But I think it was, I almost feel like it's similar to how you interact with patients. And it's all about being like, you know, being like smiling at the beginning, just being warm and friendly when you're answering the questions, things like that. I thought it was more similar to how we'll actually be like conducting that consultation. So that's why I liked it. Yeah, I guess that's a good way of looking at it. You, you're you almost simulating what a day in the life of a doctor will be like. Obviously, I guess with the MMI, they have a lot more opportunity to test you on your role playing and how you're going to apply yourself to a situation which can't really be done in a panel interview. So I do totally agree with that. I guess looking back now, is there anything particularly you would have wished you would have known before like, you began your degree as a med student? Hmm. I don't know. Um, I wish I would have known. I wish I would have known, like, from, like Chrissy mentioned earlier on, like, I didn't know there was a graduate entry, like, route and things like that. So I didn't get the grades I wanted to at, like, what would have been equivalent to A-level. So I thought that was it. Like, I had to, like, wait three years. I was going to have to apply as, like, an, uh, like, the undergrad route and things like that, like, in longer I just wish people had, like, told me sooner about graduate entry and things like that. Because I found that, like, really nice to know that, like, there was a course that were people that were just like me who had done previous degrees and things like that. It was accelerated. Um, also, I just think about knowing about the balance between personal and, like, work life. Because everybody portrays medicine as, like, this really intense course. And it really is. But, like, no one tells you, like, how to balance, like, your personal life and then studying. So, yeah, that was one thing I wish, like, people had talked more on for me. Because sometimes it can be really stressful and things like that. So, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, the only thing, like Heather said, I wish I knew graduate entry medicine was a thing. So I didn't know what I wanted to do when I graduated. I was lost. Uh, like, what jobs am I applying for? Like, 
I didn't even know what to apply for because my degree was biology. I should apply for research jobs, but I hate research, so what am I going to do? Like, so I was really, I felt really lucky the day that I found out, oh wait, I can actually do this thing that I've always wanted to do and just never had the opportunity to do it. Um, so yeah, I think that's the thing they should tell kids a lot earlier. Um, but yeah, other than that, I can't think of anything else. I wish I had better interview technique. <laughs> That's the only thing. But yeah. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, I think my biggest thing is the is the same as what Heather said, which is even though it is a really intense course, balance is super important. And I think that's something that you don't necessarily see a lot when you look at what other medical students are doing, especially on social media and things. It seems like it's all work all the time. Um, and I think not only is that kind of unrealistic, I think it's also generally unhealthy. Like, and this applies not just to medical school, actually. I mean, in life in general, so you just can't work all the time. You have to have a balance. Um, but I think there is kind of a somewhat prevalent culture of like that is what the goal is to be working all the time and to never have any fun or anything um and i just yeah i hope that people are aware that that's not what medical school is and that's not what your life should look like perfect so i, I guess a good follow-up question would be you guys have all successfully made it into medical school now are there any particular myths or misconceptions that you guys had that were stigmatized within med school that have all has been broken down. I'm still thinking, so if anyone wants to go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would just say we have, uh, even though like we're in all online learning and everything, speaking with my personal tutor, I feel so supported in everything. Um, like he, he always, I don't know if it's just my personal tutor, but he's always messaging me, emailing me like, hi, hope you're doing well. And then whenever we meet up, he does, he's always there like, yeah, we want, we really want you to do well. We're always here for you. Like they are always offering support. So I find that really helpful. Um, okay. it's not just a, you're not just one student cast off to see to fend for yourself. Like it might seem like that sometimes, but I know that if I am struggling on something I can always just reach out really quickly yeah perfect yeah I think uh the whole myth that you're kind of thrown in the deep end on one hand yes we were thrown in the deep end like we had a lot of like content stuff like that but um they don't just tell you in the first week to whip out your stethoscope and start listening to someone's heart like that just doesn't happen it was only last week that we actually used it to listen to the heart so I think that's a misconception that like you get into med school and like you're a doctor from day one. Um, like Chrissy said, you have personal tutors. They they do walk you through like you start with our first session was like hand washing and things like that. So they teach you the basics. You are really well supported. Um, and you can con like um, as Chrissy said, the peer mentor and thing. Oh, we have peer mentors at our uni, which is really nice. Um, and the sec like oh, people have this misconception like the older years are usually like you know. Con I don't know, like they're like the mean ones and stuff like that, kind of like overshadowing. Actually, the second years are really lovely. Um, you can always talk to them and things like that. And that's what I think people get nervous about, like talking to older years and things like that, like branch out. Actually, everybody's really supportive. Like they were in your position before and they're willing to support you. So, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Um, I think the one that I have is maybe the myth that medical school is really competitive. Um, and in a way, I don't want to say that's not true because it is, but what I found is that the way it's competitive is very different from at least the way my undergrad was. Um, in computer science, definitely there was a lot of competition in university and then kind of afterwards between uh, you and your peers because everybody knows that there's a limited number of jobs and there's a limited number of very good jobs. and your performance kind of directly correlates to your ability to acquire those jobs. Um, and so everything is assessed and everything is assessed relative to your peers. Um, and in medicine, that's not the same. Like our course is mostly pass fail and we all know we'll have fairly similar jobs at the end. And I think that makes the environment very different. Like people are much more willing to help each other and work together than they were in my undergrad. Like there's much less interpersonal competition um, from what I found. However, I will say 
people's competition with themselves in a way is a lot higher. Like I think people put a lot of pressure on themselves. Um, and so that's good and bad, right? Like people are less worried about competing with the rest of the class and more worried about just like, Oh, can I do this perfectly? And this kind of ties back to you got to have balance. Like, don't overdo it. Yeah, for sure. I think this is something that was really surprising, especially to me in that, Obviously, people come from a science degree, especially, uh, and uh, yourself will know there's only so many people that can score that 70%, and anybody below that, well, everybody's aiming for that first. So, yes, you do get people that are competitive in, because that's what they, everybody's aiming to get to that spot, obviously, if that be a job or graduate entry medicine. But once you've made it there, I think what I've understood from speaking to a few different people in that, the competition becomes more you're working together rather than working against each other. So do you feel like the, the teamwork aspect is there compared to your previous degrees then? Oh, a hundred percent. Um, obviously in my previous degrees that, like, yeah, I did work in a team, but that was like by choice in a sense and not everybody did that. Um, whereas in med school, they do like we have things like problem based learning, so PBL. So we're we are automatically put in like group settings and things like that. Our clinical skills, we work in like groups of six and things like that. Like it does encourage the whole teamwork aspect and things like that. And it goes along with what Hirsch is saying that you don't feel like you're competing with anybody. You're if anything, you're just working with each other to get the best possible mark. Yeah. So I feel like teamwork is like a huge emphasis in medicine. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely agree as well. I mean, in my undergrad, there wasn't really any competition. We're all just learning biology. It was great. But um, now we are we are thrown into teams. You have to work in a team. Like Heather said, we have PBL, we have clinical skills. You have to get to know people on our course and how they work and how to interact with different people. And I really enjoy that. Like, at the end of the day, you don't want the person opposite you to be a shit doctor. Like, you want what's yeah. best. <laughs> like, you want everyone to do well, because if they don't, that's just going to make everybody else's job harder. And it's not going to be very good for your patients if they have botched surgeries. But, yeah. yeah. Totally agree. Um, yeah, I agree. The teamwork aspect is really good. I guess... Like I said before, I think in my undergrad, it was very different. Like whenever we had team things. Um, and I think the system also partially pushed people in this direction, which is, for example, if we had a teamwork uh, or a group assignment and there were five people, sometimes it would be like the system is you work together, you all get a grade, and then one person will get 10% extra um, as assigned by the rest of the group. And if you have a system like that, like then it's bound to like, it, I just have no motivation to help anybody else on my team, right? My motivation is purely, can I make sure I'm better than them? Um, and I think that that was not a very healthy environment all the time. And so I really appreciate the fact that in medicine, everybody is purely just trying to help each other. Like it is in everybody's best interest for all of their peers to do well. Um, and so that's really nice. Like everybody is genuinely motivated to help everybody else. But yeah, I guess one of the, the biggest misconceptions about medicine is that it can take over your life. So how have you guys found balancing, obviously, your your studies with extracurriculars or working, if that be? Uh, yeah, so as a you know, I do quite a bit, you know, I'm quite involved in a lot of stuff. Um, like, I'm an education rep and a senator for uni and things like that. So I'm a lot involved in a lot of the academia side of things about like what's going on, like with the medical board and things like that. Um, and I also work on the side because I'm a student and I don't have a lot of money. So sorry about the ambience in the background. It's just uh, <laughs> this way. Okay. Yeah. So I'll, as a student, I don't have, I also, because I've been studying for four years, and I've come straight into medicine, I don't have any savings or anything like that, so I do need to work. Um, so it can get very stressful. However, like, I'm so lucky, like, to have the, the two people on this call, like, because we just do, we always make sure to every week just do, like, something fun, like, whether it's, like, baking or just, like, dyeing our hair or rock climbing or things like that. Every week, we just 
select or we we say like okay we have a plan in place just to like chill out and just do nothing and then it makes like I think it's important to do that because we always schedule like meetings and things like that into our calendar what about actually scheduling time for ourselves and just to have fun so that's how I think I've managed to survive the semester it's just by yeah having like having amazing friends and just having a good time with them great answer thank you yeah I definitely agree with Heather like these two are just so fun to hang out with and we do have a great time so just having them there and knowing that you have that support and like the girls I all I live with we we all we all get on we all have a laugh like just having them there is really helpful because when you leave your room you stop studying you go and make your dinner there's all these friendly faces like that is really helpful for me um and yeah i go cli rock climbing once a week i make sure i get out of the house especially during lockdown that is really useful making sure you have that time out of the house but yeah perfect thank you um yeah i think i don't remember exactly what the original question was but um oh, so the the question was just um how, how how did you find time for extracurriculars within, obviously, such an intense course? Yeah. Um, so I think that, I, I agree. I think for me, the biggest thing is like being able to spend time with friends. Um, and one thing that was really important is making a conscious effort. And I think the other two kind of alluded to this, which is like, you, um, like we do schedule in time for everything and not necessarily for ourselves. And I think starting off on the course especially during covid that was quite important like it's not that easy to meet people when you're not going into university every day um and so making a conscious effort and like investing that time up front to meet as many people as you can and to try to build relationships was very helpful because you kind of have to get over that initial hump like oh this is an acquaintance not somebody i can just hang out with and spend time with without thinking about it um and I think that if you don't consciously make that investment at first, it can be difficult to get to that point as you move forward. And for me, that's kind of an important thing, like having really good friends around. And so I feel very lucky to have these two. <laughs> okay, um, so thank you. two of my best friends. Yeah. So I guess, what was your vision going into the future then? Like, where can you see yourself after graduation? Right. Oh, <laughs> my day. Honestly, um, well, I see these two being a part of my future, no matter what. I see, like, honestly, like, everybody else says, like, oh, you find, like, your lifelong friends at uni. But no, you really do. Like, genuinely, like, I see, like, that is one thing that I know for certain. In terms of my job, like, so I'm very interested in research still. So I'm hoping to get some um, experience during the summer and things like that in research before, obviously, I... Like, in five years, I guess I'll be doing my foundation <laughs> yeah. training. I have no idea what's going on with that anymore um, since the point system's changed. Uh, but I just know that hopefully, like, yeah, they'll have the same amazing people and that even if I'm not sure what I'm going to do in terms of speciality or where I'll be based, like, I'll still have, like, an amazing support network and whatever I do, like, I'll be happy. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I have no idea just see where it takes me see what placements i get see where i end up um I yeah I, gu <laughs> I, I guess you guys are all on your baby steps at the moment so again i don't think anybody's expecting you to know what you want to do for the rest of your life essentially <laughs> um, i mean i want i'm thinking at the minute maybe i want to specialize in specialize in peds so maybe hope that i'll be doing stuff towards that um but I'd maybe maybe i'll we'll do limbs and back and i'll decide i want to be an orthopedic <laughs> surgeon. <I don't> <laughs> yeah i guess maybe not the most interesting response but i'm kind of in the same boat it's like no. it's just way too early i guess to say <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's kind of interesting to get people's different opinions, obviously speaking to students that are like F1 and F2, most of them have started off saying, oh, I want to do A&E, and then some of it end up going like, obviously, the complete different way. So I guess it's 
all dependent on your experiences throughout medical school you can go in with a passion but until you actually do it and learn more about that subject you don't really know so completely uh, understand so i guess for, for for future medical students watching this are there any golden pieces of advice you'd like to give them within like the application process um start early it's never too early to you know try and find volunteer work and things like that um and don't get disheartened when things don't go your way like i experienced that throughout applying for med school whether it be not getting in as an undergrad and then not getting the grades to not even like getting like a hospital placement or anything like that like those kind of things will happen and it's okay don't look at what everybody else is doing around you look at what you can do and just like it sounds really cheesy but just believe in yourself because if you do and you get through all those hard times like you could be sitting here like me being like a first year medic and i never thought there was times i didn't think it was going to happen like especially when I was like getting told like rejected from unis and stuff like that and I was seeing all these like other students like getting so many offers and things like that but again it's just about focusing on you and like what you can do so yeah yeah totally agree yeah like Heather said it's never too early to start um so start now start yesterday but um also don't be discouraged if you get super sidetracked because if you're like me, I'm a major procrastinator. I put them off to the last minute. So just do like little and often, whatever you can, get it in there. And don't be afraid to ask the people around you for like to into to practice interview you. I was always really I hated doing that. I hated having practice interviews with people I knew. It just it was the most embarrassing thing ever to me. But it practice interviews help a lot because when you're actually in there you already know what you want to say it's just getting it out whereas if you don't practice you can be put on the spot your mind goes blank you don't know what you want to say whereas if you've had that rhythm built into you already it helps a lot yeah. perfect thank you yeah i think not being afraid to fail is really important um, I don't know if this is just me, but I do feel like in medicine in general, there's kind of this common attitude, which is like, if you're meant to do it, then, or some people are just meant to do it and like things just go really smoothly for them and they're born to be doctors and they'll just go through the system and become perfect doctors. Um, and that it shouldn't be this process of like trying and failing and readjusting. And that's really unrealistic. And I think that it's also it's not that desirable Like you want people who are able to try something fail and then adjust their process um that's what that's what the career is and so to think that that's not going to apply to you when you're applying to schools um is probably not a helpful attitude so just like don't worry if things don't work out exactly the way you're expecting um and be prepared for that in in your future life like that's that's going to happen sometimes and it doesn't mean that you're not meant to be a doctor it's yeah no yeah i mean it's really honorable because it sounds like most of you guys haven't come from the stereotypical of your father or your grandfather was a doctor and obviously you've got that path driven out for you because they know the process so it does sound like it's very honorable that you guys have actually been been pro what's the word <laughs> you, you guys have actually proactively gone and sourced the information and that that's resulted in you guys actually being here today so it's really commendable yeah so I, I guess just finally for for people starting out their first day at med school what would be your take-home tips i guess it'd be pre-covid <laughs> um first thing i would do is like make friends that is so important because we, we've talked about like all this teamwork and things like that but i think when people start med school they're always like oh my god okay i have to study like you know 20 hours a day like everything like that no just like enjoy like first of all just enjoy your achievement of getting in because not many people can say like yeah i'm a med student and things like that you worked so hard to be there just enjoy like take a moment and then yeah just make friends and things like that because like 
Chrissy said, like, there's going to be time, like, you know, after you study and things like that, you're going to want to break. And in med school, there are going to be really tough times. Like, there will be weeks where the content is just really tough. There's a lot of it. Or just having off, like, just an off time. I think I've experienced that and many have as well. So just make friends because those people are going to get you through it. And even, like, in teamwork, like, they'll help you. If you're trying, like, if you're trying to be, there's not going to work if you just, like, say, I'm going in this, like, alone and I'll do it alone. Just, like, yeah, be open to everything. Thank you. Yeah, like Heather said, make friends. Do things you're uncomfortable with to make friends as well. I met these two in a veggie vegan club, and they're not even veggie or vegan. I'm the only vegetarian. <laughs> like, these two. D so, yeah, do things you're not comfortable with. Do things you wouldn't normally do. Just make walk up to strangers and say, hi, be my friend. <laughs> and they probably will want to be as well. They're just too shy to walk up to you. Um, and then also make to-do lists. Write down the thing that's helped me is just to write down everything I need to do, otherwise I would forget half of it. Like, these two remind me every day, like, oh, have you done this? What? <laughs> I didn't know how to do that. <laughs> like, so yeah, that's what I'd say. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, make friends. Um, and, <laughs> and I guess more specifically, spend time finding the people that you really click with. Like, it's not a huge class but still in a group of 115 or whatever there is a lot of variety and there will be people with similar interests to you and stuff so i'd say it's worth putting in the time to find the people that that you really get along with because you are going to spend a ridiculous amount of time together um <laughs> so for better or for worse you might as well try to make it as fun as possible Perfect. Great answers. I mean, thank you again for taking the time out of your evening to come speak with me. It's It's been a, a real eye-opener to get to know each of your stories and how you've eventually got to meet each other and go into med school. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, for, for our society members and our viewers watching this, is there anywhere they can find you online that you'd like to plug? Heather? Okay, so yes, we do have our own Instagram page that is called uh, Barely Medics, which is at Barely underscore Medics. And so we've kind of alluded to this about the whole like getting your personal balance, like personal life work balance correct. So yeah, we just kind of show you like the almost like the fun side of medical school and things like that, because obviously there's a mis like, there's a conception like you have to be studying 24 seven, like, and it makes people feel very like inadequate. We're like, it's okay to just be chilling and things like that. Obviously, we promote, like, study tips and things like that, but, yeah, we also just want to have a good time. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.